Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Appraisal Buzzcast. We have a great topic for you, desktop appraisals and what appraisers need to know about them before getting started with them. Hal, thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here, Jim. Um, you know, this is the first time I've seen you online since the uh, ACT conference about a couple of weeks ago. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and one of the people we had there was Jim Bomberger, who we're going to be interviewing today on Desktop Appraisals. Why don't we welcome in, welcome him in. Hey, Jim, how are you? I'm doing great, Jim. Hal, good to see you again. Howdy, Mr. Baumberger. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. We're uh, we're about to get a late spring up here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, it's after um, the 80s by the end of the week. After the uh, Axe Conference, I got home and was sick. And then oh. as soon as I got over that, uh, spring has sprung in Tennessee. And we've got so much pollen that my black truck looks kind of green. <laughs> that's a lot of pollen <laughs> yeah it's pretty insane well jim baumberger um do me a favor and tell me tell me a little bit about your history in the industry how did you how did you get into the business and um and kind of what are you doing now so let's start with the history how did you get in this business yeah well like a lot of folks hal it was uh, it was the family right my dad was an appraiser and a realtor uh, so I literally grew up as a child at open houses and riding around uh, out taking comp photos and uh, he used this old Polaroid. You take the photos, you had to wave them and wait till they dried enough to be able to peel them. <clears throat> you had you had to, you had to shake it like a Polaroid picture. Yeah, you did. So uh, so anyway, I literally grew up around it. I swore I'd never be an appraiser. I actually had two careers before I turned to appraisal. Um, but I've been in appraisal for about 33 years. So I like to think I'm getting the hang of it now, Hal. <laughs> you got to be real careful thinking that in this business. Things I, change I know, that's so why fast. I say it. It's dangerous. But uh, no, I, I was a, a fee appraiser for a little over a decade. And I worked for a firm that specialized in sort of doing the complex and unique and difficult properties that other appraisal firms didn't want to do. Uh, so that was great experience. And uh, then I went to work for a lender for the first time. And it was kind of an epiphany for me because it was the first time I actually had like things like a retirement plan, paid vacation, you know, sick leave. Uh, uh, so I got spoiled and, and I worked for lenders, you, you know, for the next probably 10 or 15 years. Then came the horrible 2007, 2008, you know, credit foreclosure crisis. And by then I was, uh, you know, either running uh, divisional or national appraisal organizations for some of the biggest banks and lenders in America. So I got a ton of experience working inside the lending institutions where uh, you, you might say the sausage is made. And then I uh, also was appointed by the Oregon governor to uh, lead the Oregon uh, Appraiser Certification Licensure Board. So I became a state regulator chair. And so I, I think the, the sort of the unique thing I bring to this is that I understand how lending and appraisal and regulation compliance come together. And as you know, a lot of the hot topics involve sort of the nexus among those three. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I love appraisers. Uh, I, I have uh, always loved uh, the appraisal process. Uh, sometimes I don't like some of the things sort of outside, you know, in the industry. Um, and, you know, after after um, HVCC was codified in Dodd-Frank, uh, appraiser independence, in, you know, changed a lot of things for the better. But one thing I think that was unfortunate is it sort of isolated appraisers all of a sudden, we didn't really know our clients anymore. We didn't have relationships. Uh, we didn't really talk to them. Uh, so you, you lost a little bit of that feeling of being, you know, part of a team or something. And, um, you know, Hal, if uh, I, I'm just going to say this, I'm not trying to be immodest, but I, I think I made a career for myself working in lending institutions by being able to deliver bad news to sales managers with a smile and some empathy. Uh, so sometimes I would say what I did is I, you know, because we, we can promise great service, great communication, but the value is what the value is. The repairs are what the repairs are, right? We can't give them yep. those. So yep. I kind of made a career of putting a smiley face on appraisal for folks that I had to deliver bad news. 
I love it. I love it. Um, and Jim, what are you doing now? What is your current gig? Well, I, uh, you, you know, I was running a national AMC for five years and then I bought into a regional AMC and I ran that for five years. And I'm happy to tell you now that I'm retired, um, except for uh, I have the privilege and the high honor of working with you and the, the team at uh, Praiser eLearning. And so uh, I've been privileged to author a couple of courses for you all, teach a little bit. And um, I really enjoy that a lot, not only because I like all of you personally, but I like your values as a company and how you're out there trying to support the working appraiser and help them thrive sort of in the face of what I call accelerated change. It's almost overwhelming some days, the, you know, the pace of change that has hit this industry. It is absolutely overwhelming at times. Um, yes. And I know that a lot of people are kind of freaked out about that change, but um, you know, you and I have both been around long enough to see it change and change and change again. Um, and I know you've heard this as many times as I've heard it, you know, in five years, there won't be any more appraisers. And first time I heard that was 1986. Yeah. That's about the time I first heard that. Yeah. <clears throat> Still not um, true though. And I don't think it's going to be true for the foreseeable future. I agree with you 100%. Uh, let's take a quick moment and give a shout out to one of our sponsors and then Jim Baumberger and I will come back and finish up our conversation. The Appraisal Institute recently launched its Instagram page, AI's latest presence on social media joining Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and the Face Value podcast. Visit and follow AI's Instagram page for another way to access valuation news and association updates. www.instagram.com slash appraisal institute. Welcome back. Let's talk about desktop appraisals and what appraisers need to know when deciding to do these types of appraisals or not do these types of appraisals. Jim, you know, just give me kind of the, the, the broad brush overview of desktop appraisals and, and what appraisers need to consider. Yeah, that's it's a great question, Hal. And I, I know it's also, a, I'm going to say it can be a bit of a controversial topic. So I, I want to be sensitive yet I, I'm always a glass half full kind of fella. So in the face of change, I'm always sort of looking, okay, so, you know, there's a door closing. What door is opening? Where's the opportunity? The reality is um, I almost view this as like, um, you know, advanced uh, technology, uh, these, these 2D scanners, uh, these remote inspection apps, big data, if you will. All these things sort of came together and, um, you, you know, so appraisal has changed and it's changed forever. But in, in a way, you can think about it. Some of the changes are very, very positive. <clears throat> For example, once we went from Polaroid to 35 millimeter to digital cameras, right? We didn't have to go to the photo mat every day and get 24 hour developing. So uh, anyway, the, the point is, is that um, technology has allowed us to use these tools and if you've looked at a scan, a 2D scan of a house, I mean, you know, frankly, I took pride in the way my sketches looked, but I couldn't generate a sketch like that if I spent a week on it, right? So, and the accuracy is is quite amazing. Uh, so we've got these tools and the GSEs, they want to, they want to try to make appraisal a little bit quicker. And, you know, truthfully, they would like it to be more cost effective. But I want to point out that this may surprise appraisers. When Fannie Mae did a national survey of all their lenders and they said, what's important to you about appraisal modernization? And the number one thing for lenders was sort of the, the speed and the convenience for the borrowers. The number two thing they said was important was mitigating what they called appraiser capacity restraints. So we have plenty of appraisers in normal volume or low volume, but we saw in 2016, 2017, we saw again in 2020, um, heading into 2021, we saw that when there's record high volume, the reality is the static uh, uh, number of appraisers can't keep up in the higher volume periods. So they, the lenders said, number one is we want it to be quick and easy for the borrower. Number two, we want to make sure during peak volume, we're not restrained by the number of appraisers. And number three, they said, we hope there's some cost savings. 
So actually from the lenders themselves, cost savings is way down their priority list. They're not necessarily worried because as most of us know, the, the price of the appraisal is a pass-through cost for lenders. So what I think appraisers need to do is master this advanced technology, kind of leverage it to their benefit so that they produce a better quality product and use some of the computer analytics that are built into their software now to, to uh, justify market extracted adjustments and present values that are more strongly supported. So I think for appraisers, it's, it's sort of embracing the change. And, and then perhaps as we go through this, we can talk about some of the common concerns that appraisers have. But I think it's, you know, embrace this technology and you'll continue to thrive and be relevant. You know, Jim, I had a, an employer years ago said to me, he said, I went out and spent a lot of money on my first digital camera. Um, and I spent a good, I don't know, four hours trying to resize the photos in Microsoft Word so they looked right in the report. And I printed the report out and I was so proud of it. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. You've got to go out and take real photographs of this property. They'll, we will never see a day when digital photographs work for appraisals because it's too easy to manipulate. And that was 20 years ago. Right. Um, and now I don't know a single person that uses film photography for appraisals. Um, and when it comes to, you know, people lost their mind when laser measures came out. Oh, yes. Um, and they got over that. Uh, and now these, the, you know, Kubikasa, uh, Remote Val, all of these apps that use the LiDAR function in, in, a, in a smartphone to gather information and put a sketch together. It's amazing. Like you said, I, they're the prettiest sketches I've ever seen. And more importantly than being pretty, they are remarkably accurate. Yes, they are, Hal. And then for someone like a trained appraiser, when you look at them, you can actually identify functional obsolescence, which as you know, you cannot do in a traditional appraisal sketch. So right. it's, and, it's and a the lot other, of powerful information. Another thing I've noticed is actual appraisers, if um, the, the software doesn't catch a room, actual appraisers, know when something is not right on the sketch. Like, wait a minute, that, oh, I need to go scan that room too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's do this. Let's take another quick break and get a shout out to our other sponsor for today. And then we'll come back and wrap this up. Since 1978, LIA Administrators and Insurance Services has been offering E&O insurance to valuation professionals. LIA applies superior customer service, exceptional liability education from Peter Christensen, and unparalleled claim defense managed by Claudia Gaglioni. LIA offers errors and omissions, commercial bonds, general liability, cyber liability, and real estate agents and brokers E&O. Visit liability.com or call 800-334-0652. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Hal Humphreys. You're listening to Appraisal Buzz. I'm joined today by my good friend, Jim Bomberger out on the uh, uh, Pacific Coast. Um, Jim, you know, you've got a new course coming out on appraisal learning. Um, and as you said in, in your introduction, um, you've retired, but you're now teaching uh, with appraisal learning. We're tickled to have you here because, <laughs> folks, if you've not taken a course from Jim Bomberger, he is one of the best presenters I've ever seen. He's so good taking complex concepts and putting them to terms and, and slides and things that help it be sticky and help you understand it and, uh, and help it stay with you. Um, so let's talk about, uh, your class. So you've got a self paced option. That's a, um, it's basically asynchronous. It's online. Appraisers mm -hmm. can log in and take that at their own pace. But you've also got live Zoom class offerings where you sit in a Zoom classroom with the appraisers um, and walk them through the material. I think the next one is on May the 9th. Is that right? That is right, Hal. And it's just like you and I here. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of the classes being more dialogue. Um, and uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to just lecture so we basically, as you said, we're going to walk through this all together. Uh, I love when people have questions, even when they share a little, you know, quote unquote war story. It really enhances the learning for everyone. Yeah. And then you couldn't be more accurate. I mean, this is basically this is sort of like navigation 101. So, you know, there are courses out there that are more conceptual. 
this is sort of a nuts and bolts, hands-on mechanical. This is literally how I will do this assignment, but it also dives deep into the technology and also the property data report. And what I guess I might call the third rail of this subject, which is a third party data collection. Oh, we don't want to touch that one, Hal. It's hot. <laughs> right. right. It's, 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 you will die if you touch that rail. Yeah. yeah. So I want appraisers to have some confidence and understand, uh, first of all, you know, it, it isn't going to be a 17 year old pizza delivery person doing these inspections. Uh, there are some published standards now and requirements for education and training. Now, it's nowhere near the, you know, the formal structured training of a professional appraiser. So I don't want to, you know, even create that uh, misunderstanding. But for the first time ever, there are written standards and requirements for training and such and quality control and monitoring their work. And then there are very severe consequences for these folks if they... Um, somehow present either misleading or inaccurate data. So uh, they will have some skin in the game. They will be watched by the GSEs the way appraisers are. Uh, for appraisers who are familiar, the GSEs do something they call appraisal quality monitoring. They're going to do that for data collectors too. So they don't want bad actors in that space. And the wealth and depth and breadth of information that they hand to an appraiser is absolutely astonishing. Tell me about that. So, I mean, you know, that's one of the biggest, um, biggest barriers to appraisers getting on board with doing desktop appraisals is I've got to rely on third party data. There, there are appraisers out there saying that if you do this kind of work, you're violating use pet because you're relying on third party information that you can't verify, um, that kind of business. Talk to me about how you can get your head around taking this. And, and, and I want to be really clear here. These assignments are not for everybody. Some people will never get the head around doing them and that's okay. That's a business yes. decision, right? Um, right? But for those that do see a value in doing, you know, less in the field work, um, expediting the process a little bit um, and still charging a reasonable fee, how can they get their head around, you know, using this information provided about the property by someone else? Yeah, that's a good question, Hal. The, the, the first quick point I would make is appraisers already use all kind of third party information. Probably the most widespread would be MLS data, right? I mean, uh, now I know we have some brothers and sisters in non-disclosure states, and I don't know how they struggle with this. But for most of us in disclosure states, we rely on the assessor's information. We rely on the MLS. We will look at plat maps, surveys. Um, you know, let's say we're going out to the home and they had a they had an inspection and they needed a new electrical panel. You know, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to see an inspection report. Uh, so we rely on things all the time. Uh, so the um, the information from MLS, I think the little phrase at the bottom is that it's uh, considered reliable, but not guaranteed. And so this information would fall into that class. And um now, the, the property data collector signs a certification that this is their unbiased independent work. Um, they don't favor the property. They don't favor the lender. They don't favor any outcome. And they're giving us, uh, they're giving us a depth of information that literally corresponds to the appraisal form. So wealth right. of information about the neighborhood, about the site, uh, about the improvements, even the exterior and such. And they take a, just a host of, you know, color photos in and out. And as we've talked about, they're using some sort of 2D scanning app. So the floor plans are very reliable. And then if there's an appraiser out there that says, boy, I don't trust that LIDAR to major home. So NASA drove the Ingenuity helicopter on the surface of Mars using LIDAR to navigate it. If they can fly a helicopter on Mars from Earth with LIDAR, uh, I, I think they can measure, you know, they can measure a house. So you're getting all this data, you're getting all the photographs. And then as an appraiser, you still have MLS, you still have the assessor's records, you have all your market knowledge, um, and because you still need to be geographically competent. Now, just because it's a desktop, that doesn't mean suddenly I'm appraising in 50 states and five territories, right? Right, I right, still right. have to know my market. So all that comes to bear. I'm bringing the appraiser's knowledge, judgment, experience, market uh, knowledge, and using the tools and the information and developing the most credible results I can. 
And then I, I want to make sure I point this out. And this is official. I mean, if you go to the appraisal foundation, you train to be a USPAP instructor, which is like becoming a jet fighter pilot, right? They teach them, they drive home this point that USPAP requires credible results. We all know that sort of the layperson's definition of credible, it's worthy of belief. And so um, USPAP measures credibility in terms of intended use. And as you know, how intended use and intended user, it helps inform the scope of work decision, everything we do, how we present information, right? So the fact of the matter is, and this is something I think folks need to understand, this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, you can verify this with anyone, uh, but you could be an appraiser and you could do a desktop and the lender might say, gee, we're, we're, we're not comfortable with the value. The owner's not comfortable with the value. Would you go out and do a full appraisal? You could go out then and do an appraisal. And this is just a, a <coughs> hypothetical to help illustrate. So you could go out and let's say you did a desktop, you did the best job you could do that scope of work, that intended use, and you said it was worth 280. And then you go out and you do your full process and you decide, you know, it's really 310. Some folks might say, oh my gosh, now you're in big trouble, right? Because you did a desktop at 280, now you're doing a 1004 at 310. The reality is each of them could be credible and compliant and completely reliable for the scope of work. So uh, you, are, you are held, as a desktop appraiser, you're held liable to not use information that you know is inaccurate or unreliable. So you can't use something you know is stupid, dumb, or wrong. Other than that, it's not on me if the property data collector gives me information and I deem it reliable and I use it within the scope of work, the hardwired certification limiting conditions. It's not on me if there's something I could not know because I did a desktop. So right. there is not additional liability. And, and as we go on now, right now, I'm also a realist, Hal, and just like not every appraiser is the top of the class, not every property data collector is the top of the class. Over time, they're going to get better and better at it. And appraisers are going to get better and better at leveraging that information. And so I think the process right now has some wrinkles, to be totally honest. But over time, we will iron those wrinkles out and the process will become smoother. The data collector is more experienced and competent. And I think appraisers will sort of relax and have more confidence around these. I think you're right. I think you're right. I do think there is some, um, you know, viable concerns about yes. um, liability issues. Um, and if a property data collector goes out and does some work and I rely on that and consider it to be reasonable, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, the property data collector probably does not have E&O insurance. Um, the appraiser does. And I, I understand that a lot of appraisers have this fear that since they have the you know insurance, they're going to be the one that gets sued over something if it goes wrong in this process. Um, all that said, um, you know, I, I think you're probably right in the limiting of liability uh, based on a scope of work. Um, and at the end of the yes. day, scope scope of work is everything for appraisers. Um, and if you yes. define if you define the scope of work. Um, appropriately and thoroughly. Um, I think you're probably right. You can limit some of that liability. Um, Jim Bomberger has a course coming up on appraisory learning May 9th, um, desktop appraisals 101. If you're curious about the topic, if you have any questions or concerns about the topic, this would be a fantastic way for you to number one, get some continuing ed education done. And number two, ask the expert in the classroom about your concerns. And that's over to appraiserelearning.com. Uh, Jim Baumberger, I can't thank you enough for being here with us today. I always enjoy spending a little time with you and, and chatting and talking about appraisal issues. Uh, let's get Jim Morrison back in the room if we can. Jim, good to see you again. Uh, did we you, have Tom. did we have an anonymous appraiser question for Jim Baumberger? We did. You guys kind of got into it a little bit at the end there. So we need some new anonymous appraiser questions from our listeners. Reach out to us at comments at appraisalbuzz.com. You can ask anything. You don't. We won't include your email address, and we'll ask the experts your question for you. Uh, but this question, uh, it says, 
I won't do hybrid appraisals because I'm not willing to put my Eno insurance on the line for something that someone else messes up. So you guys kind of touched on that right at the end. So, you know, how should appraisers react to that? I'm going to I'm going to take the first stab at it because I think Jim and I may have a little bit of a disagreement on this and I don't think it's a, a thing that's going to end a friendship. Um, but, I, you know, I have concerns about that very same thing. Um, I have um, I, the fact that most property data collectors are not going to have, you know, insurance. Um, anytime there's a lawsuit filed, they're going to go for the ENO insurance first. Um, and the appraiser stands, um, to be in the way there. So I think there are some concerns there. I do think that as an appraiser, if you define your scope of work properly, um, you can avoid some of those issues. Jim, what are your thoughts on the question? Well, we, we probably do slightly disagree on that, how, and it definitely will not end the friendship. <laughs> so I... Again, I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive, but as you know, I also like to tease around a little bit. So I'm, I'm not always the most uh, serious. Uh, what, what I guess I would say is, is in my career, I worked with appraisers that had what I call the bunker mentality. They felt they were appraising in a bunker. They're always taking in fire. And, you know, everything is sort of a concern about um, litigation and, and a concern about losing your license to the state board. And generally speaking, I, I, I rely a lot on the scope of work that you said. Basically, you tell them what you did. You tell them what you didn't do. You tell them what it means. And I, I believe that if you practice ethically and you do the best job you can based on the information that we all rely on every day, we all rely on third party information every day to do our work. You do the best job you can. You're honest about it. And, and I really think that that is the shield that keeps you out of trouble. And then if you if you take the time to read the hardwired certifications that the property data collector signs, it literally says, paraphrasing, right? If I give you bad information because I'm incompetent or I give you bad information because I'm a crook, I could be, uh, I could be fined and I could be imprisoned. Yes, imprisoned. I could go to property data jail. So the certifications they sign are very harshly worded in that regard. And so I think based on scope of work, based on the certifications, based on what you're signing when you sign a desktop appraisal, is there liability? Yes, but I don't think there's any more liability than in a traditional appraisal assignment. I really don't think the third party data collector exposes you to all that additional liability. I think it's about the same. So just be honest. Do good work, and that's your best defense to stay out of trouble. I mean, my my um, argument has always been uh, when it comes to, and you've seen, Jim, you've seen it these classes in the past where where they talk about you know here are the five thousand eight hundred and sixty two ways you're going to get in trouble with your state regulators. <laughs> you're going to fine for this. You're going to lose your license if you do this. You go to a USPAP class. I remember some USPAP instructors back in the day, just like. By the time you left USPAP, you wanted to find any other line of work than appraisal because you're terrified that you're just going to go to jail for some mistake you made. Here's the thing. I think about it in terms of the good faith principle. Um, approach the work in good faith. Do, you know, analyze and consider your competency and your credibility um, and approach every job uh, with with good faith and and do the absolute best job you can. Um, you know, it, I, I talked to an appraiser in Jackson, Tennessee, uh, probably about three months ago, and there was some discussion in the classroom about desktop appraisals and hybrid appraisals. And some of the appraisers like, I'm never going to do that. That's just rah, rah. And, and one of the older guys, he looked at me, goes, here's the thing. I'm in this business to make money. Mm -hmm. And if this is a business model where I can make decent income, I'm going to do it. Um, so again, I think at the end of the day, it's a business decision for individual appraisers. Agreed. If you can get your head around how to do this work um, and do a higher volume, less time, make more money in the long run, then then maybe this is work for you. If that's not work for you, it's okay. You don't have to do them. That's a great point, Hal. All right. Well, Jim, man, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, 
and I'm looking forward to your May 9th class. Um, Jim Morrison, do we have anything else for today? Well, we will have the links for anybody that does want to check out that class. They'll be in the uh, the description below. So anybody that wants to check it out on May 9th and live, or if they want to do it at their own pace as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim. We really appreciated it. All right. And I hope to see you in my class. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might see me in your class as well. <laughs> Good. That is your appraisal buzz. I'm Hal Humphreys for Jim Morrison and Jim Baumberger. <laughs>